Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with singer, songwriter, and harmonica player Tad Robinson. We caught up with him on June 12, 2020 during the COVID-19 lockdown to talk about quite a bit in this very storied career that he's had. Born and raised in New York City, he attended school at Indiana University School of Music, graduating there in 1980. He played regionally with the group called the Hesitation Blues Band and then moved to Chicago where he became the vocalist for Dave Spector and the Bluebirds. Please get to know him and dig this interview. Oh, man. You know, hanging in there. How you holding up? <laughs> well, it's a, brand, it's a whole new world, isn't it? <laughs> and alive. Is it ever? Is it ever? Yeah. Well, that that's, you know, kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you. I appreciate you taking a minute out. I, my first question to you is, is like, in early to mid-March, when did you know that we were going to get to this point where live music was going to end and we were going to enter this whole new realm of living? It seemed, you know, a lot of musicians have come to the conclusion that uh, we were the first to be uh, furloughed, so to speak, and we'll, we'll most likely be the last to come back because the venues that that hire musicians are just barely getting back on their feet. We don't know if they will get back on their feet at the end of this whenever that end is. But when did I see that all coming? Um, it sure did seem like uh, when when I did my last shows, I did um, March, I think it was 12th, 13th, and 14th, or 13th, 15th, 14th, 15th, something like that. And we did three shows in a row, and we were really on a roll, and the band had never sounded better. It was one of those strange, you know, I hate to sound like a cliche, but something was really clicking for us and felt really good with, I, I have a new drummer, a guy named Brian Yard, a very well-rounded musician, uh, plays all sorts of styles. He's not a blues purist, but he was really an integral part of what was shaping up to be a really interesting um, period for my group. And then, of course, the roof came down and everybody was, was sent in the lockdown and, uh, it seemed right then and there, you know, in mid-March that uh, we were in for a really long haul, I, you know. So, yeah, and here we are still, you know, there are little glimpses of of daylight. Some people are calling about some types of work. September seems to be a focal point for us right now where there's a lineup of festivals that I'm supposed to do. And we'll just have to see if those happen. They're all outdoor. The outdoor things seem to be more promising uh, because there are reports that um, COVID-19 doesn't uh, do well in, in outdoor settings. And so people are a little safer if they're socially distant and they're outdoor. It's, it's you know, it's a safer environment. And so all of the indoor types of venues that we typically do, all of the, you know, restaurants, bars, venues that have stages indoor, you know, all those little mom and pop places that make up a career in music, all of those places are really struggling to, you know, to, to recreate, you know, reinvent the wheel of how they're going to go forward. So, the outdoor stuff maybe will be something that is somewhat viable going forward. Um, so we'll see. Let's go back to the beginning of your life. You're from New York. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, kind of your childhood and how music became your world. Well, you know, it seemed as a kid growing up in Manhattan that music was everyone's world. I mean, it, you know, you had your, as a kid growing up, uh, you had your baseball glove and you had your transistor radio. You know, <laughs> those were the the uh, the tools of of childhood. And um, in those years, the, what what I was hearing on on the radio was, you know, it drew me directly into uh, R and B and soul and uh, all the all the great voices that were were around us during those years, everybody from Sam Cooke to Ray Charles to Ann Peebles and Otis Clay and John Lennon. And just, you know, you could go down the list, Moldy Gay, Curtis Mayfield, Smokey Robinson, 
uh, Dusty Springfield, all these influences just were being, they were all there. You know, this is obviously a pre-internet world, and it, it seemed like, it seems like people say that now with the internet, we were able to hear more, and, you know, that you can hear any kind of music at any time. But in, in some respects, uh, those years of growing up in, in the environment, which at that time was AM radio, it, it it's hard you'd be hard pressed to find a better more fertile music environment than then even though we were only getting you know a limited amount of you know compared to what we can we can hear now but uh that was the education i was getting and and you know i as a kid i just kind of got drawn to those voices and it was uh, a thing where I, I always thought I would be a singer from a very early age, and it was hearing those voices um, on on the radio that that drew me into that into that world. You know, in this time right now, quarantine and not being able to play live, you've been all over the world. You've played on a lot of stages. Do you have any like magic moments or any memories that are really kind of coming to you that are giving you comfort during this time of of not being able to play live? Well, yeah. Um... I, you know, like you say, I have played all over, and that makes the world really small. And one one great thing is that I, you know, I'm hearing from my my friends worldwide, and everybody is trying to pull together in their own way uh, from their own uh, lockdown situation. People are reaching out, so uh, all of those contacts and friends that you make in a music life where you're where you're uh, where you know people all over the world. For, you know, for instance, early on when Italy was being hit so hard, and I reached out a lot, you know, to all my friends there because I toured uh, in Italy several times over the years, and I have some dear friends there. And you know, it was really, it was very sad to hear what was going on, but it was good to hear the voices of my friends uh, through texts and through emails and people saying that they were okay. Um, so, uh, but. I don't know. I think that directly before this whole period, uh, I put out my record, Real Street, uh, on Severn Records, and that was kind of the culmination of my whole career because I went back to uh, kind of the the um, the birthplace of soul uh, music to record in Memphis for that record. And so, if you're asking, you know, what was one of the great memories, one of the things that keeps me going and keeps the fire lit. Um, I would I would point to that experience of going to Memphis last year and recording um, my my latest record. And I had the the pleasure and the honor of recording with the members of the high rhythm section, uh, Leroy Hodges, Charles Hodges, and uh, Howard Grimes, uh, respectively. Howard on drums, Leroy on bass, and, and Charles Hodges on Hammond organ. And we made a record together. And uh, for your listeners who maybe don't know, the High Rhythm Section were the was the band that recorded on so many of the hits uh, of Soul, uh, Otis Clay and Peoples, Al Green's famous sides, uh, Let's Stay Together, Love and Happiness, uh, So Tired of Being Alone, etc. Were recorded with, with the High Rhythm Section. So I got the chance to work with them, and that was a really pivotal thing in my career and something that uh, gives me solace, you know, that, that I was able to do that before this, this whole situation because um, it was kind of a culmination, as I say, of the many strands, kind of pulling together many strands of my career to be able to make that record. And then it got nominated for two Blues Music Awards, uh, so, um, you know, so that that was a, a major thing, the, the record, the, the recent record that I made. Talk to me a little bit about when we do return to the stage. You know, it's going to happen, and when it does in full force, when both musician and audience gets back there, what do you hope we all collectively realize, silver lining through this time away? The COVID-19 disaster was quickly followed by uh, the George Floyd disaster, and um, his murder, and now we are in a period where, you know, protesting for human rights and human dignity and civil rights has actually taken precedence over 
the health scare, and and it you know it does make sense to me that this you know a lot of people are risking their health to go out and 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 protest injustice right now. With with being a musician in this environment, I, I think that ultimately when we do go back and perform for live audiences, I think that we have to see that the community that music creates and the the, uh, the spark of communication between an audience and an artist, I think the most important thing there will be that musicians reflect on what has happened, but also remember their role as uh, artists who are supposed to uplift people. I mean, if, if, if you're music, it's kind of like a gut check at that point to, to remember what am I here for if I am here and I have an audience, if I'm fortunate enough, enough to have an audience that is listening, it becomes incumbent on the artist kind of to be um, uplifting those people. You know, they're, they're, so you have to reassert the the meaning of that connection between audience and artist. And to remember that not to waste, not to squander the opportunity because you are in front of people. I'm not saying that we are supposed to be preaching some kind of political ideology, but we should at least reflect on what has happened and, and try to be, um, you know, a messenger for some kind of good message. And and I think that'll that'll go a long way. I mean, people are not looking for your, your garden variety dime store blues band to tell them how to live and how to think. But I think it it is important to remember our role. And music has always been there for people to to heal, to be uplifted, to nourish the soul. So that that might be a tall order, but I would hope that I remember you know, what my role is as a musician, particularly as a singer, because I'm the guy delivering the message, you know. And so, so those are things that go through my mind. And, and I don't know if I'll be able to live up to that, but that would be something that I would hope is on any musician's agenda when we finally all get back together. Tell me this. Everyone has a perception of you, um, your family, your friends, your fans, but you're the one that's living your life. Who do you think you are? I'm a student of the music you know i'm uh, i'm a white guy who sings predominantly in african-american musical tradition so um some might call me an interloper uh a wannabe but but others might see me and i, I kind of see myself as a work in progress someone who is 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 I, i've always been thrilled with the music that i that i was brought up on you know like i say motown stack soul music, R&B, those are the music that spoke to not only me, but every kid in, growing up in the 60s, you know. I wasn't unique in that respect. But I took it really deep to heart, you know, and I, I, I wanted to learn to be part of those musics and be part of the tradition. And I went to Chicago back in the day, and I played in my harmonica, and I learned from the 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 tradition, the oral tradition of blues music, and I came up kind of in the ranks and played blues clubs and, and got signed by Delmark when I was, you know, in my 30s. Uh, and Delmark is one of the, well, it's the oldest jazz and blues labels still still running now. And so there was a deep tradition uh, at Delmark of blues music. So I kind of joined that that being signed by that label was the first step and then moving on to Severn Records, which is also a blues and soul label. Um, uh, so how do I see myself? I see myself as, as, like I say, a student of the music, but trying to put my own imprint on it, trying to be a guy that if someone hears me on the radio, they can go, oh yeah, you know, I recognize that voice. So you want to have your own imprint, your own um, flavor, and your own brand as a singer, because you know otherwise you're you're just a dime a dozen. So I see myself that way as as a, as a work in progress, a student of the music, but but a person who is moving up kind of the ladder of of the music and trying to have my own uh, my own brand and my own sound. 
I like that answer. Hey, man, thank you for taking some time out. It's very surreal time on the planet to talk about music and, you know, what's going on. I appreciate it. I love talking with you, Joe, and thank you so much for, for uh, thinking of me. And um, I, I appreciate your time very much and your listening time. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview. We we'll give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Tad for his time, music, and story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz all the time, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.